So as you can see, winter is really set in. I'm at the off-grid pond and we're gonna do a big, actually a massive pond makeover. As you guys know, the pond was not super successful this year. It silted up really bad and then the fish died. I think the fish died not from the silt and the poor quality, although trout love to have clear, cool water. The temperatures wasn't an issue and the silt was somewhat of an issue, but the major issue was oxygen this year. So we are going to get on that for next spring. Obviously there's no fish left. We're draining the pond completely and we're going to do something amazing. It is a massive, massive undertaking. It's a good sign. So I really wanted to include some clips of what the before looks like because the transformation by the end of this is pretty amazing. So on the last episode, if you guys wanna go back on that, we did empty the pond. And so we did kind of a tally of how many fish we actually managed to get out. So you guys can decide whether you think it's successful or not. We did manage to get a few, but I don't wanna ruin the surprise. You should really go back and kind of outlines how and why we ended up where we are as you can see at the bottom of the pond it's it's mostly clay like this stuff if you pull it out and mold it and dry it it really turns into pottery so it is some pretty significant stuff and then when it dries out it dries hard as a rock but the problem is when you put it at the bottom of a pond it never dries out and then everything at the edges of the pond wants to slough into the pond so what we're dealing with here is trying to shore up a loose clay substrate from constantly falling and dropping into the bottom of the pond. So the idea here is we're gonna do something that you know is a little bit different as an application that you would normally expect. So obviously first step is to get rid of all of the fish and then restart with a brand new clean slate. So obviously first step is to get rid of all of the water in the pond. Based on the flow rate of the trash pump, we know it pumps at about 10,000 gallons per hour. So that's about five or six hours. So it's a 50 to 70,000 gallons of water. And as you can see at the bottom, it's completely mud, clay mix, not much useful for anything. But what this pond does have is a really good redeemable quality. It has cool, clear spring water. You can see the water coming in there. This stuff is uh, more or less goopy clay type fine sand. So we'll geotextile that whole sort of slope there down to about here. So our main tool for this job is a fabric. It's called geotextile. It comes in a, a large roll. Uh, you can see it's pretty thin, but it's a very durable. This is 15 feet long. It expands uh, in width and then in length, I'm not sure. Kevin ordered a giant roll of it because we have to cover a big, big area. So what we're gonna do is drape this down the side of the pond, and then we're gonna lay the rocks on top. Geotextile is a fabric that is used for erosion control, also for building roads, because what it does is lets water through, but it prevents soil and other things from eroding away. And you can actually build on top of boggy or mucky surfaces by adding a substrate on top. So that's what we're gonna do. First, we're gonna drain the pond, then we're gonna line with fabric. Sounds simple, but it's gonna be a ton of work. There's gonna be a ton of labor involved and there's gonna be a lot of buckets of rocks. There's the geo there. You can see some plant matter starting to attach to it and grow to it. And uh, this thing hasn't caved in where we put the rocks. So we'll just carry on down. It's perfect time to do it.
Uh, Kevin just dumped off a load of rocks in there. I, we, I don't know, I've lost track. Well, not that I was counting, but I'm pretty sure we're up over tens of thousands of rocks we've put in to this pond to shore it up and make it more hospitable to trout. I'm now down here at the, hopefully the bottom. There's, there's ice down here, as you can see. Uh, plates, sheets of ice, but uh, some of it's just air pockets underneath and, and then obviously a little bit of water pockets too. They tell you what, the bottom of this pond smells like, like dookie. It really smells bad. And uh, I know why, I actually, uh, I see a fish down there still. So there are some remnants of last year's efforts of the pond, but you can see how it's shaped up already. I'm at the bottom of the pond, probably almost the deepest spot. I'd say the deepest spot's probably right here. And as you can tell, maybe you can't tell, but the pond is well over my head. So I would say I'm probably about 10 feet of water here uh, when the pond is full, and that will happen in the spring. So we've made some good efforts. What we want to do before winter sets in is actually get the bottom shored up here so that the top here doesn't slough off. But obviously the last run we weren't able to do that because it was submerged in water. So we've got to get at least down to the base here and then we may we may work on the bottom at a later date to dig it down a little bit deeper but as you can see this is going to cut down on our silt a lot because the bottom here is still silting up it's clay and the sides are all clay and as you can tell like when the fish are swimming around they're going to kick that clay up all along the banks but not anymore so this geotextile is going to protect everything and there, there's a ton of rocks and there's gonna be a ton of habitat for uh, insects and vertebrates, minnows if we decide to put them in here, crayfish. All kinds of animals can live in these crevices versus what we're looking at before, which was straight up just goop, right? Nothing much can live in, well, some stuff, mosquitoes and things like that can live in just this goop here. But you see how fine that sediment is? So that's easy to get up into the water column and stay in the water column. I made a mistake. Now I got it on my fingers. Anyway, we're gonna keep working on things. Maybe I'll just rinse it off right beside this uh, old dead trout here. Yep, that smells wonderful. Ah, uh, it doesn't smell too, too bad. Anyway, we're gonna keep working. We got a little bit left to go. By a little bit, I mean still quite, still quite a bit. I mean, every shovel we put in here is a shovel less that we have to, but man, was this ever a ton of work, but I think it's gonna be worth the effort. The proof is gonna be in next year when we, uh, when it fills back up with water and, uh, and if we see clear water, we'll be off to the races. Look at the sheer cliff here. See, it's quite the effort to put in and, uh, but we've done it. So you can start to see what these rocks look like. They're all different sizes. These are what grow up in the fields. Uh, the, you know, by sintering, 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 I think it's called, uh, the rocks are actually pushed up out of the soil. So these are the bane of existence for farmers because what happens is these continue to grow almost forever. You know, through the pressure in the earth, so sand is compressed together into rock and then because they're the rock is larger than sand the sand sifts down below the rock and then forces the rock up so uh, throughout the years these have been collecting at the edges of fields because farmers move them from their farm uh, where they plant because obviously they don't want to pile the rocks in the way when they're planting so you can see it's made a pretty good dent over here we have quite a bit left so we've been using solar panels for aeration. This is a product by the Dugout Dude, dugoutdude.ca. It's uh, completely solar operated, hooks up to a metal weight, and there is a, a diffuser which sticks down to the bottom of the pond, and that pumps air. It's not pumping water. Water is another aeration system, but that requires a lot more power than you would get from a typical or a cheap or inexpensive or economical solar setup like the Dugout Dude provides. So in this case, we're just pushing air through six pumps at the bottom here, which come down and then come up as a bubbler. 
Now the issue we had last year was obviously in the winter, we get a lot of cloud covered days just like this for like three months of the year. And the winter came really quick on us. The sun disappeared, the sun's low on the horizon. So we need something to back this up, which was something we're gonna be looking into for next year to get us through like the shoulder seasons when the fish are not growing as much, but also need to be maintained, uh, you know, their the quality of life and necessities like oxygen so we will find a way to back this up with battery power but this works really really well in the summer and it's keep them kept them alive all the way from spring until now you might be able to hear it just starting to kick in so that's just enough sunlight but that's a heavy cloud cover and it's already cut out so we need a little bit more juice to make this run all the time so guys when we first started pumping we used a uh, standard pump for clean water this is a more robust version. This is also from Princess Auto. Uh, the other one worked good as well, but once the pond got lower and it became more silted, it started sucking up too much junk. So this is a more regular trash pump. It's a two inch as well. So it sucks a lot of material at the same time. So it's gonna suck up, it's gonna get, essentially be sleuthing the bottom here. Um, Princess Auto has a really good policy and that no sale is final. So we weren't happy with how the other one worked for our purposes, so we returned it and uh, we upgraded or side graded for our purpose for this one. This is a more, like I say, it's a more robust, so it's gonna pick up more of that, that junk that's at the bottom of the pond. So we'll fire this thing up and uh, try to drain this down right to the bottom so we can work a little bit easier on what's levers left at the bottom of this pond. So it's nice to be able to just dump a load right in the corner here and you'd think that that's mostly how this is going but it's actually not the case because if you tell if you look here there's a big pile of rocks and it's up about a couple of feet now if the pond was extremely deep and we weren't concerned about losing some of the volume of water that would be it but now what we have to do is come and spread them out so they're only you know one or one and a half uh, rocks tall so and that maximizes obviously the number of rocks we have to use because each one of these has to be hand-picked and put into the tractor, which is what I'm gonna show you right now. Almost this entire forest was reclaimed, meaning it is restored to its original, uh, original form, right? It's native kind of vegetation. So we're entering the cedar forest, but this used to be all field. And as part of the reforestation program, it has been completely as I said, restored to its natural, its natural state. And uh, part of that is there's some, always some interesting things you'll find off in the woods. So I'm just about to take you to our source of rocks, which is a fair distance from the pond, but thankfully the tractor makes short work of it. But uh, what happened, as I said, is the, the farmer would have removed all of the rocks ongoing from the field up here, historically, and would have dumped them into the forest where we could then pick them up and then move them down into the pond. We're looking for rocks. They're hunting, harvesting rocks. Hundred year old rocks. Well, like, I guess it's older than that, but they were put here probably a hundred years ago. They like it's like finding potatoes in the forest. It's like we're fishing for potatoes. Potato rock harvesting. It's kind of satisfying. <laughs> you find like a potato like this, and you think it's 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 a rock, but it looks a hell of a like a potato. So these are uh, old caches. Well, not caches. I mean, they're just dis disposition spots of disposed spots. Um, you can see it's the edge of the forest. Well, it used to be a field here, I assume, and the farmer would just dump them down in here. And obviously over time, uh, soil, topsoil has landed on top of them, 
Uh, this is the one of the, the trickier spots. This uh, here whole section was actually filled up with rock. Uh, and it doesn't look like we've made much of a change here. But uh, that volume of rock would have been, you know, this high covered in dirt. So this is how every single rock, pretty much, except for some of the bigger ones, we've able, managed to scoop up with the, uh, with the actual shovel. But everything else has been sifted and uh, removed. And I guess some of these rocks were not as buried. So they were uh, more exposed to the top. We're getting now down to the bottom. What's that show down there? Down there, you can see. If you get rid of that loamy peat, they're all fucking there. So there, a tree kind of grew on top of this pile. So I don't know if I can, probably can't even get one out, but you can see under there, the tree kind of grew out. So this picaroon has been a good asset. You can pick up a uh, picaroon at uh, Princess Auto. They've got all kinds of tools there. So that just kind of get, lets you do less work. It's not like a shovel where you have to take a lot of soil out of the way. It's just moving a little bit that's locking the stones in. Works a little bit better than a rake too. But uh, that's bucket load number 6,000. I don't know. How many rocks do you think we put in here already? Is it over 10,000? Well, each bucket's probably about 600 pounds. I'm not going pounds, I want number of rocks. Do you think like 20,000 or 30,000 rocks? Easily. This, should... this pile is as high. We'll get somebody to count after. By 40 feet long. Well, I'm just looking at the area we covered. Maybe we can figure it out. If we figure out the average sized rock and then do a calculation on the 50 or 60,000 gallons of pond surface and then we've all covered it with the number of rock which the average rock size is probably let's say eight inches so somebody can do that math eight inches and you've got a uh, 50 or 60 thousand maybe 70 thousand gallon pond how many rocks is that somebody can do that math you know i know i have a genius on my channel who watches it who can uh figure that math out so rock by rock. Do we have any more piles? Is this it? This, from here over, it's all. This is fresh dirt with rock in it. And there's rock over here too. Tons, tons and tons. This is this is. What do you think? Fun work? <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> it's pretty monotonous, but it's gonna. I think it's gonna probably fix the pond. I I would think. Yeah. No. It's kind. Of, it, in a way, it's satisfying. It's it is satisfying because you get to look back on the. the it's a big change. Yeah. Right? Exactly. And you're moving or like you said, you're moving a rock pile that's of no use or value to uh, to somewhere where it has a purpose. Yeah, and I, I, I'd imagine, I don't know if it's gonna be possible, I wonder, if we, I wonder if we could swim in that pond at the end of it without like making it silt. Yeah. That would be like a really interesting goal, right? Yeah. And if you could do that, then obviously the fish are gonna be a lot healthier. Oh, exactly, yeah. So that's the idea, but uh, it's been a ton of work. How many days do you think you got in this? Like you've been here every time Kevin's done it. I haven't been here every time, so how many days are we on now? Well, we got to be 10. 10 days, maybe. just, and that, 10 half days, right? To be realistic? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Not uh, not full, like, 12-hour days or no, anything no, like that. No. Just, like, about four hours. So that's about, you know, that's that's 40 hours. It's 80 hours combined and maybe an extra 40 for me. Yeah. So 120 hours, 120 man hours. <laughs> in, yeah, just in moving. <laughs> just moving rocks. And it'd be t tons, <laughs> tons, tons of rocks. Oh, tons, yeah. tons and tons of thousands. I would think thousands. I'd say 20 or 30, 40,000, something like that. It's got to be a yeah, lot. I'm not. It's, it's got to be a lot. It's hard, it's hard to, to, <laughs> to really calculate it. It's a ton of work. Yeah. It's been a ton of work. So that rock cache started over here. And uh, we're about 30, 30 or 40 feet. We've been working away, grabbing everything we can down maybe two, three feet from the top. And uh, you see, it's kind of snowed in over here on this spot, but uh, we started kind of over here. These, some of these rocks were actually on the surface 
and uh, you know, and the rest were a little bit lower. There are some other rock caches, but uh, they're further away. So if we get to the point where we're short, we can always go uh, work on those ones. But this is the closest pile. So all we're doing is moving, you know, something that was on the property from one spot to another and uh, making use of it. So making the, the uh, actual property more productive. So if we can get those rocks to serve a purpose and make our fish healthier, then we're actually adding productivity to the land. So these are the tricky ones because we got to make some kind of shelf here. It's not helping with all the snow, but uh, there's a bottom, and we want to kind of build backwards off the bottom. So got to roll this big slippery boulder down without completely losing it. There, that's not too bad. And then there's another one here. We just throw it there. And then once that's on the bottom, then we can start filling in here. And you can see that. So we just need some more bigger ones down there and then we can fill this section in here. And then we'll have a good run all the way up to the top. So as you can see here, we've laid a good layer of rocks and what we've been doing is just pulling them down and then filling in the little gaps here. And uh, these are gonna make a great home for all kinds of different aquatic or semi-aquatic animals, uh, crayfish, minnows, and all kinds of invertebrates are gonna find their home in here. And then the trout will happily swim along looking for things to eat. You guys let me know what you think we should put in this pond. I've got some ideas, obviously the regular culprits, but uh, the sky's kind of the limit. We don't really have a shallow end of the pond as you can see anymore. So we may or may not have some edu vegetation. Edutation, that's a good word, uh, but we can always add some later on into into the, the edges here just by adding some topsoil and then finding the kinds of uh, weed species that we want. But in a trout system, we really want to have our emphasize the clear, uh, cool, clear water. And so that's what we're aiming for here. If this was going to be a catfish pond or crappy or panfish, then it wouldn't matter about the water quality. So this is like the ultimate challenge as far as building a, uh, a pond, one that can house and hold trout from something that was, you know, substandard when it came to the substrate. Gravel bottom would obviously be ideal, or rock bottom, but uh, we don't have that, so we're making it. And so not only do these rocks have to be picked up once to put into the tractor, but then they also have to be picked up again and placed in the right spot in order to use the fewest number of rocks possible. So it's a matter of taking from the pile here and then finding a spot like this, which doesn't have a rock, and then carefully filling it in, and that will make a nice blanket. Now we can always add more rocks on top, but we don't want to get into a situation where we run out of rocks or move more rocks than we need. So you can see here's a spot that's bare, that needs to be filled in, and then we also want to be able to fill in the banks outside of the erosion area. So anywhere there's a slope here, we'll have to get filled in all the way up to the top here. And you see there's a little bit of a convex area here. So that's where water might collect and then run down. But as it trickles down in here, it's gonna pick up that soil. And then in between the rocks, where there isn't any of the fabric, we'll have vegetation grow up and that'll hold onto that soil. So all the soil, every time it rains, won't end up in the pond. Now something you guys might think is happening with this pond is that it's actually getting silted up from rain and stagnation, but that's not the case. This pond is actually spring fed. There are tiny little springs 
throughout this pond which actually fill it up. And so that brings in cool, clear water. But we noticed as soon as the fish went in that it started to get cloudy. And I think the reason for that is, is that actual fish were clouding it up. We're kicking up mud and silt and the clay, which is a very, very fine particle, up into the water column and then dispersing it. So of course, when it rained, that made the problem even worse. But just even having 25 or 50 fish in that pond was enough to create a more resilient, more permanent problem. And you can get that same effect if you put bottom dwelling fish like catfish, which will kick up the bottom a lot. And uh, it doesn't matter so much if it's a catfish, but when it's a trout who like really clear water, it doesn't work. So after we're done rebuilding the pond, we're gonna plant up this area here. So this is the uh, leading edge of the pond. See, there's a quite a bit of a grade here, or maybe you can't tell, but it flows down into the pond area here. So it's important to have some vegetation. We uh, grabbed some overseed from Bass Pro Shop uh, and uh, Cabela's Bass Pro Shop. They have got a ton of stuff too there. You can get all kinds of housewares and you know camping. Uh, there's also fishing and hunting, you guys know that. But uh, you can get clothing and boots. And they, again, they had some seed there. So we planted an overseed, uh, like a food plot kind of seed. And uh, that shored up this area here because before it was all just sand and mud. And of course, that's another spot where a lot of that silt was ending, ending up flowing down grade and in, into the pond here. And it may be hard to tell levels, but uh, I think you can tell from there that it's quite a bit lower. In fact, from standing down in the middle of the pond, it's about 10 feet from top to bottom and all that draw is coming in. So, so doing this is really gonna eliminate the problem of the fish kicking it up and all that silt going in from the edges. It's really hard to get perspective on how deep we are. And this is the very bottom here. You can see if I was sitting on the bottom that the pond edge would be well over top of my head. And we still got this challenging spot here because it's a sheer drop off. You can see those rocks are just hanging on to the fabric by sheer weight. But until we get all the way down here to the very, very bottom, those are going to want to continue to slide down. And then we have a spot here by the pump area there. And then uh, if I can make my way over here without slipping, there's this area here down here at the landing. And uh, we're we should be good. We'll decide what we want to do at the bottom of the pond here. We had thought about maybe sinking a culvert down here, like a 10, a 10 foot, so that we could do a sheer wall. And of course that wouldn't be visible, I don't think, from the top, unless you were had a camera drop down here, but that would add a lot of volume because as far as like going much deeper, we're kind of at the threshold, right? You can tell how sheer wall that is. It's hard to go, it's hard to go straight down, we're just running out of area to go any deeper. So if you wanna, we wanna get more volume here, that's the only way to do it. We can shave off this side here a little bit. It's kind of not as steep. It's not as steep there, but that's where the water mostly comes in. So you want it kind of gradual, and then there'll be a shallow end over there. So that'll be, you know, for the min minnows, and uh, you know, the minnows like to breed and hang out in the shallows because they're safer. Once they count, swim out here in the middle, they're in trouble of predation from the rainbow, for sure. Very bottom. Can I go in? Good. Very bottom. We're at the bottom? We've left this spot over here blank because if we want to get a machine in and out, this is where we drive. So it's kind of like a boat launch. We do have some geotextile here and we'll put some smaller rocks on top so that the uh, tractor or whatever machinery that we want to bring down there can drive over top. And uh, then we can, if it gets muddy or whatever, we can add another layer on top or we can take the geotextile off and then reset it. So I did measure the bottom of the pond and for future reference, it is uh, 23, 23 feet long and uh, 14 feet wide, the base, the bottom. 
So the top obviously scales out.